name's Emily Astra, I'm at Brown. Uh, my co-authors, Claire Halloran, Rebecca Jack, and James Oaken. And the paper is entitled Pandemic Schooling Mode and Student Test Scores, Evidence from US States. Uh, so the, the broad motivation for this project is the, uh, is the changes in schooling mode over the last school year in the US. To give you some broad background, in March of 2020, uh, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, effectively all of the schools globally and in the US closed for in-person instruction. When we got then into the 2020-2021 school year, there was a very uneven opening status for schools across the US. There was more opening in some states than in others. There was more opening in some districts than others. There was an evolution of opening over time. In general, there, there were more schools open in the spring than in the fall. There were relatively fewer schools open in the, in the winter. And these decisions largely came down to choices made by individual school districts. So states had some role in dictating what was possible, but a lot of the decision making fell to school districts uh, on their own. There is a very broad question that I think we will be grappling with for, for a long time, uh, which is what are the short term and the long term consequences of a lack of in person schooling. Uh, this paper is going to start to take one little piece of that and start to, to explore it, uh, which is to look at to look at test scores. So what we do in the paper is we do basically two things. So first, we're gonna, gonna introduce um, and use a new database uh, on schooling mode across the US over the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, this is gonna be based on data we put together uh, that's comprehensive across 36 states covering at this point about 30 million uh, US K through 12 students. Uh, this data set we built and now have made publicly available either at the district or school level uh, over sort of different time periods that we that we have. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that data and how how we put that together and then and then we'll use it. We'll merge it in with some test scores from 12 states in the spring of 2021. And we look at the changes in test scores and pass rates on these state tests during the pandemic and how much variation there was in those test score changes by uh, schooling mode, focusing in particular on whether the school was in person or, uh, or not. Um, just to, to sort of uh, say, before I tell you about the, the schooling data, just to sort of say uh, what, what we have had to use um, or what has been available to use before this, uh, this database um, in terms of understanding what modes schools and districts were in over the school year, uh, there was no systematic federal effort to track school district modes over the over the school year. There was a lot of discussion about it, but it did not end up falling to any particular agency, and so it didn't happen. Most of what we relied on over the last year was data coming out of uh, a company called Burbio, which tracked uh, 1,200 large school districts at the district level, effectively scraping from, from websites to see whether they were open by week or by, or by month. Uh, there is also a tracker called the AEI Return to Learn tracker that had some similar data, uh, also pulls in some data from a place called MCH. Um, so there were a few sources, but generally not comprehensive, not down to the, not down to the, to the school level and focusing mostly on larger districts. So there's like 13,000 school districts in the US. Um, and for many of those, we had relatively, we've had relatively limited data. So what we, what we did um, in, in pursuit of this paper and hopefully, uh, hopefully others um, is, uh, is build something we've called the COVID-19 school data hub. So we did this through contacts with state education agencies. So we asked state education agencies uh, for any information they have about their opening modes of their schools. Um, we asked them for either, you know, what mode was the school or district in? Was it hybrid? Was it virtual? Was it in person? Uh, if they knew, we asked them, how many kids did you have in each mode? We pull this data in by week uh, or biweekly or monthly, whatever uh, the, the state had available. Um, in some cases, we've utilized information from something called the Pandemic EBT program, which has helped us uh, fill out some of these uh, some of these data sources. And the end the sort of goal was to create a public uh, a public data resource where we could have all of this uh, all of this information. So, I'll show you a little bit what that looked like, just so we get a sense of kind of what did school reopenings look like over the past year um, and how much 
data we have where we're where we're missing it. Um, so this is a map of uh, of school reopenings by district uh, over in in September, um, and so you can see, um, you know, there's not there are many states that are that are empty, um, but you can already see the the blue is in person, the red is virtual, and the yellow is some kind of hybrid. A lot of different variations in in hybrid. Um, so this is what September looks like uh, as we move into November. Um, you can see the pattern that's you know fairly consistent, which is there is sort of less reopening in the the sort of northeast and and uh, and in the west, um, more in the sort of center of the country. Um, Florida is very open. Texas. Here's what January looks like, pretty similar to uh, to November. And then as we move into the into the spring, um, into say March, uh, and then ultimately into May. Uh, we can see there's more, there's sort of more opening places go from uh, from red to yellow or yellow to, to blue, and we see a broader, a broader picture of, of, uh, of opening over this, uh, over this period. I should say, if you looked at this in the fall of 2021, um, it, everything would be blue. Um, so we've seen, you know, some individual school closures over the 2021-22 school year so far, but uh, sort of pretty consistently places are at least available for for full in person full in person learning. Um, okay, so that data sort of we built that data uh, and then for this particular paper um, we're gonna we're gonna pull down the data and we're gonna aggregate it to a district time period so um, so in most cases to a district week or a district uh, district month. And then we're going to use that to calculate the share of time that the district was either in person hybrid or virtual. Um, so in this sort of in person means that the district was offering full time five day a week regular in person learning doesn't mean everybody was there full time in person so almost every district offered a virtual learning option in the last school year so they wouldn't necessarily have everybody in but the idea is what did you have available so a district could have available regular in person five day a week school uh virtual learning means you do not have access to school and hybrid is anything that is that is sort of in the middle in the middle here so any way in which the school was uh was hybrid uh we're going to use the 12 states for which we have test score data and i'll show you what those are in in a minute um so just to give you a sense of the sort of variation we're going to focus in the paper on distinguishing between in person and the other two so we have a little bit of, of you know, robustness where we separate out the other two, but we're really going to be focused on, you know, in like in person as the kind of regular five day a week school versus some other option, either hybrid or, or distance. Um, in the states for which we have also have test score data, uh, the state with the minimum in person share on average is Virginia. So, so the sort of average in Virginia um, in person learning, regular five day a week in person learning um, is like nine nine percent of the of the school year. Um, and for for Florida, it's about uh, ninety seven percent. So there's a big range uh, across states uh, in how much in person learning they were offering. Um, so, uh, so before I sort of get into to showing you the results, let me just briefly touch on on the literature. And this is not going to be this is not going to be comprehensive. I feel like we work in the space of COVID pretty much every week. The NBR working papers have more things about COVID, so I am certain that uh, that we have not been completely comprehensive here. And so I apologize. Um, you know, I think one in when we sort of think about what literature is we're, we're speaking to. There is a, a sort of pre-COVID literature about just the impacts of missed school, a lot of which focuses actually on the summer, sort of issues of summer learning loss and how much are kids losing in the summer and which kids are losing in the summer. Uh, there is then an, an increasing literature on the impacts of schooling, uh, of COVID on schools in general. So looking at, um, at enrollments uh, and sort of functioning of schools over time. And then we have actually some, some reasonable data from Europe on what happened in te to test scores in the spring of 2020. So in the US, we basically didn't test anybody in the spring of 2020 because nobody was at school. But in Europe, many schools came back for a spring term or a summer term, and there is some data on, uh, on test scores. Um, the disruptions to schooling there are smaller, but we do see some reductions in, um, in test scores, which, uh, spoiler alert, is also what we'll see in, in these data. 
Uh, all right, so, uh, so we're gonna pull data on, on test scores from these 12 states. This is based on state level testing in the spring of 2021. We're gonna focus on math and English language arts for grades three through eight. This is the sort of most consistent set of data. Some of these states also do testing of older kids or testing in science, but this is kind of the two core, uh, the two core pieces. And our primary outcome is going to be pass rates as kind of defined by the, um, by the, the, the state. Uh, so, so let me just sort of start by showing you a little bit about, um, about what determined or sort of what is correlated with schooling mode across uh, or within, within states. So, uh, so this is table two from the paper in which we're regressing at the district level, the share of, uh, of time that the district was in, in person uh, on uh, some demographics. And the first two columns are, are using both within and across state variation, and the second two columns control for, for state. So, uh, so one of the sort of couple things to pull out from this. So one is that you know in, in most of these specifications, um, the uh, the relationship between the baseline pass rate and the share uh, in in person uh, is positive. So for the most part, actually, places with a higher baseline pass rate appear to have a have a higher in person share. Um, so just better off districts or districts that were doing better before uh, have a are more likely to to end up in person during the school year. Uh, in general, districts with a higher share of Black students are less likely to, it, to be in, in person. That effect is quite big. Uh, the relationship between share free and reduced price lunch uh, is positive. So it looks like sort of conditional on race. Income seems to, um, to sort of positively predict share, share in person. And then notably, the, the COVID case rates. So if you sort of ask, like, how do you, um, what's the relationship between COVID rates and opening? Actually, that tends to be positive. So it tended to be the places with the higher case rates were more likely to, uh, to open. And, and that relates to some other factors, which we don't have in this regression, uh, notably the share, um, the Republican vote share in the district is a, has been shown elsewhere to be a fairly significant predictor of, of reopening. So that's who, who opened. Uh, and now we're gonna look at kind of conditional and sort of like what happened to, to pass rates. I'm gonna show you really three things. So first, uh, the, the changes in the pass rates just in general, then the relationship between the changes in pass rates and schooling mode, uh, and then briefly discuss um, sort of one kind of question about sort of what's driving what we see. Um, so, uh, so here's a graph of the changes in pass rates in math. Um, over these states. You can see at the bottom, the states we have, Virginia, Minnesota, Massachusetts, Nevada, West Virginia, Colorado, Ohio, Wisconsin, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Wyoming, and Florida. And we've ordered these by their average in-person share um, in um, the average in-person share uh, that they had during the, during the school year. The, the y-axis here is just the change from the previous year and the, and the triangles, and this is math, these are math scores. The triangle are the, the pandemic year changes. So this is 2021 minus 2019, which is the last year pre-pandemic for which we had scores. And the circles at the top are year on year changes for previous years. So just to get a sense of kind of how much general variation are we seeing in test scores uh, in, these, uh, in these places. And so what you can see is, um, you know, Virginia is a pretty significant outlier with an average reduction in test scores about 30 percentage points in pass rates. Um, but in general, these reductions in scores are kind of ranging in the sort of uh, 10, 10, 15, 11 percent kind, of, uh, kind of range. They are sort of slightly less, uh, the test scores do seem to sort of be slightly uh, losing slightly less in these places with um, where the, there was more in-person learning, although you know, this is cross-state variation. Uh, here, is, uh, here are the, the changes for English, um, and we've actually put these on the same, uh, same y-axis so you can kind of compare them to, to what we see in, in math. Uh, there are reductions here too, they are much smaller. So the changes in ELA pass, score, pass rates are kind of low under 10% for all of these, uh, for all of these, these states. So uh, here, is, uh, here is what we see in terms of, here is one way to visualize uh, what we're seeing in terms of, uh, of the relationship between these changes and the in-person shares. So to, do, to sort of make this visualization, I'll show you a regression in a second, 
to make the visualization, we're just going to divide districts uh, based on the sort of the places with the most in person. So that's um, at least two thirds of your uh, of your time in person. The intermediate, which is a third to two thirds, and least in person, which is uh, less than a less than a third in person. Uh, and we're going to just sort of show those across states. And what we're trying to, to take, what we're, what we're arguing we take away from this is that in general, and basically all these states, you're seeing that in this pandemic year, the places that had the most in-person learning lost less, or the places with less in-person learning lost more. Um, and uh, and that, that isn't true in the pre-pandemic year. So it isn't the case that we're seeing that kind of variation pre-pandemic, but we are seeing it uh, during, during the pandemic. We see a similar thing for ELA, although again, everything is just much, just much smaller. We can look at this in a, in a regression. Um, and so, so the sort of main kind of effect here uh, is say column one or column four. Uh, and this is looking at the, the relationship between, uh, between this is a, a sort of standard kind of district fixed effect regression. Uh, in which we're looking at the relationship between the, the percent in, in person uh, and the, the pass rates. So the way we would read this is to say a coefficient of 0.1 says that if you went from uh, if you went from not at all in person to fully in person, you would expect a 10% higher test score rate. Now remember, 10% higher pass rate. Now that is a, effectively a 10% reduction in the test score loss. So the average test score loss in math here is 14 percentage points. And so what this says is that that this sort of if if that's kind of the average that there's a, a 10 percentage point difference in the loss that we predict between being fully in person and fully not in person. For ELA that number is uh, is smaller it's about 3 percentage points. Uh, in the in the interaction columns you can look at this more in the in the paper uh, we look at some interactions between uh, between free and reduced price lunch or black and Hispanic share and these effects. And one of the things we see, and it may be easiest to see in column in column six, uh, is that the that particularly for ELA, uh, the impact of in-person learning is larger for worse off districts. So what this says is that for a district with a large share of free and reduced price lunch, they actually benefited a lot, even in ELA, not only in math, but also in ELA from having uh, more in-person learning. So that's an interaction that we're exploring, that we're exploring more. Uh, one sort of like thing to kind of highlight before I, before I end is that one of the sort of issues with the data is that test participation rates are lower in 2021. And that comes up a lot when we sort of talk about like, well, what should we, what should we learn from that? In the states that we use, the, the sort of participation rates are typically, um, you know, kind of a, in a typical year would be like 100%. And in the years that, that in 2021, they're more like you know 80 to 90 percent, um, although not generally lower than that. Does this explain what we're what we're seeing? Um, well, effectively, our baseline results assume that there's a random selection of test takers from the population. If we actually look in the demographic data, what we're seeing is actually a larger reduction in test taking among less advantaged groups. So we're seeing e English language learners, special ed students, um, students who would sort of typically be actually performing worse on the test are actually the students that are leading. So if anything, it looks like the test takers that remain uh, are kind of positively selected. Um, that would suggest that what we're seeing could even be an underestimate of the size of these, of these impacts. In the paper, we do some sensitivity analyses uh, around this. So, so what do we take away uh, from this? So there are, we see large test score losses over this school year. We see test score losses that are larger in districts with less in-person instruction, we don't think it's driven by these participation differences. Uh, to us, this really points to the importance potentially of, of recovery efforts, of trying to ensure that we help students make this up and that we put effort in this year to recognize that, yeah, kids are resilient, but there are some, you know, there are some things to be to be made up. There are, of course, many limitations to the paper. I'm sure that everyone can can think of them. I think some that come to mind for us are you know, the possibility that some of this is driven by differences in how incentivized the test performance was. There's a possibility that other kinds of lockdowns, which may have been larger in remote districts, are in fact responsible for some of these, these changes. And of course, it's important to note that test scores don't fully capture learning. Um, they are only kind of one, one metric of that. Um, so thanks for listening. And uh, I look forward to hearing your comments 
on the paper.